Thank you all for being with us uh, today. Let me get myself situated here um, to where I can see this properly. All right. Um, yes, and welcome to our gathering for the Biocultural Collaborative for this June 23rd, 2023. Um, we are very happy today to have with us Jacqueline Richard, who is going to be talking about um, our coast, how we got here, and what's the future. Jacqueline is the Director of Coastal Studies and GIS Technologies at Nunez Community College. We're very excited to have her here. I've seen um, her do a presentation a few times, and you're in for a treat today. Um, introducing the BCC management team, you've got me, Maida, Rachel, and Gary with you, uh, bringing this to you each month. We're sort of the, uh, the, the folks behind the curtain, I guess you can say. Uh, I get to be the, 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 the great and powerful Oz that you see in front of the curtain, but really it's, uh, it's all of us uh, behind the scenes bringing this to you. Um, so this is our, our general statement. If you've been with us before, you've seen this. Um, it's sort of that disclaimer that we don't have all the answers and we don't support any one adaptation or management strategy. We're just here together to have conversations, um, to bring up some of the important issues and um, explore some of those um, strategies and adaptations that we can do to continue to um, not necessarily just be resilient, but actually thrive in some of these communities that are um, most at risk. Here are our partners, the Louisiana Folklore Society, Center for Bayou Studies over at Nichols, Folk Life in Louisiana, Center for Louisiana Studies and the South Louisiana Wetlands Discovery Center. Um, through the work of all of these groups, we are here with you today bringing this program to you. We couldn't do that without money from folks to make it happen, so we're funded by the National Endowment for the Arts, Louisiana Office of Cultural Development through the, um, the Louisiana Division of the Arts, and we are very happy to announce that we now have BETNEP as a partner who has given us some funding to help uh, bolster the working groups that we'll talk about toward the end of this presentation. And then also um, be here with you all today for this. For, it helps fund this presentation as well. So um, I would now like to uh, pass the torch on to um, or the spotlight on to um, Ms. Maida Owens, who will talk a little bit about the Passing It On workshops um, that her department produces. Yeah, I'm real pleased that we've had just a fabulous lineup of spotlight uh, work Passing It On workshops this uh, spring, especially. And I uh, want to highlight uh, Patty Corral. With, she is a member of the crew de Maya Hule. It's a Mexican carnival crew that is becoming uh, a Mexican cultural organization and into all kinds of uh, activities. And so she taught the members Danza Azteca, and they are uh, buying costumes with some of the money and they will premiere a public performance at Day of the Dead this year. So we're real pleased with them. Uh, all of the funds for uh, passing it on uh, have been given out this year, but we're looking forward to more. So if you know anybody that needs, uh, would like to pass on the tradition, um, they should contact me. Excellent. Thank you so much for that, Meta. Um, also, I failed to mention um, in the beginning that we would love for you all to introduce yourselves in the chat. Um, so please tell us your name and your affiliation. Um, we'd really appreciate that just to know uh, everyone who's uh, who's with us today. So this is uh, a bit of the agenda that we're going to go through today. We'll have our speaker, Jacqueline Richard. Um, you'll be able to ask uh, any questions uh, to her or offer any comments that you may have about what you uh, see in her presentation. We'll also ask Jacqueline for her hope for the coast, what makes her hopeful. Um, and you'll be able to uh, also post your hope for the coast in the comment section. Um, we will talk a little bit again about the position statement, where we are for that, um, our working groups and how you can connect with them. And if anybody has any announcements, then we go into our informal discussion until 1.30. So with no further ado, um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you all Ms. Jacqueline Richard, who is the Director of Coastal Studies and GIS Technologies 
at Nunez Community College. Thank you so much for being with us today, Jacqueline. Thank you, Jonathan. I really appreciate it. I'm really excited to be here today. Let me go ahead and get myself together here with technology and share my screen. So again, thank you all uh, for having me today. Um, I am always excited to um, talk about geology and the human connection. Um, so as Jonathan mentioned, I'm the Director of Coastal Studies at uh, Nunez Community College in Chalmette. And I'm a trained geologist, so, um, and I'm a deep time geologist as well. So today, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the Mississippi River and all these resources that we have, these wonderful natural resources that I know you guys have already heard about some of the exploitation, right, that has happened of these natural resources. Um, but we're going to see where they come from. So we're going to start our Mississippi River story in a little bit deeper time than what you're used to hearing. Uh, generally, when we talk about coastal Louisiana and the Mississippi River, we start about 10,000 years ago and just move on forward. Um, but I like to start way back about 250 million years ago, so just a little bit deeper in time, uh, to talk about where these resources came from. Because all these resources that we use have taken hundreds of millions of years to develop, right? And so that goes back a little bit further than that 10,000 years. So um, this is kind of a key for the geology of where we're gonna go. So we're gonna start down here with the breakup of Pangaea um, and kind of move forward to today and see how the river has progressed its way basically down from the tip of Illinois um, all the way down here and has provided lots of amazing resources. So as much as I really wanna get into every single one of these rock layers, uh, the master naturalists usually have me come in and talk for about three hours on this. You guys are gonna get the nice uh, short version <laughs> of this geology. So as I mentioned, we are gonna start about 250 million years ago with the uh, breakup of Pangaea, uh, which goes back to the Jurassic time period. Uh, and I really love to start here because I started my formal college training as a paleontologist digging up Jurassic and Cretaceous dinosaurs. So I always love to start my, my, uh, my lectures where I'm very comfortable. Um, and so if we go back about 250 million years ago, you can see that North America, South America, and Africa had started to separate away from each other. And the reason why we have to start the story here is the Mississippi River today obviously flows down to the Gulf of Mexico. So we have to start with the formation of the Gulf of Mexico, right, to start that uh, story of the river. And so just to give you an idea of how different things were at this point in time, uh, this first picture over here on the left is from the Middle Jurassic, and these progressed through to the end of the Cretaceous when T-Rex was walking around. Um, but what I want you guys to notice is that there was a large seaway sitting on top of North America. The continental plates were moving around, which they still are today, so we have to keep that in the back of our brains that we don't live on a static planet. And as plates shifted and plates moved on and off, the South Pole glaciation right shifted as well. And there were periods of time where sea level was really, really high. And you can see here, right, in the, in the very beginning of the Cretaceous, Jurassic to Cretaceous, we've got some really high sea levels. Notice we're definitely underwater, right, at this point in time for sure. Um, but this is important because when we talk about the development of the Mississippi River, if you've got a big epicontinental seaway sitting on top, all of your rivers are going to flow right into that seaway. And so at this point in time, we had lots of rivers that were flowing, but they were going into that seaway. And so as South America started to pull away and Africa pulled away, we started to develop that very early Gulf of Mexico basin. And a good image for you guys to get in your head of what that looked like is if you're familiar with the Red Sea, right, today between, right, Africa and Saudi Arabia. Uh, Saudi Arabia used to be connected to the continent of Africa and it has slowly broken apart and moved away. That's really what the early Gulf of Mexico looked like. And when you have a very shallow water system and the Cretaceous period was extremely warm, right? We're talking anywhere from 10 to 20 degrees warmer than it is today on average, that water is going to evaporate, right? That's what it does. And so in this very early Gulf of Mexico system, we had shallow water and the shallow water was sitting everywhere where you see this purple in this picture. 
down here. Um, this red dotted line shows you where the edge of the actual continent was at that point. So if you wanted to go to the beach, right, you had to go much further north, <laughs> right, than you are today. Um, and as that water started to evaporate, we got lots of salt deposits that formed. Um, this was a very common thing that was happening throughout pretty much all of geologic time. These basins would form, water would evaporate, you get these big deposits of salt. And so the Gulf of Mexico kind of looked like the Bonneville Salt Flats, right? If you ever go to Utah um, and, you know, go check out what that looks like or go down to Death Valley, this is very similar, right, to what that early Gulf of Mexico looked like. Now you might be saying, why am I talking about salt? Um, we're gonna see that this is a really important economic driver today. This is, we're gonna talk about this in a little bit, but this is what exposes our oil and gas. Uh, and right, that's obviously led to some issues that we have with our coastline, but this started forming right at the base of the Gulf of Mexico about you know, 200 to 150 million years ago. And as we move forward in time, because I'm giving you the real high level highlights here, uh, I know I have a couple of students on here. So those, those students are uh, in for a treat when they join my class this fall and get the real details, right, for all of this breakdown. Um, but, you know, when we're in the Cretaceous, as you can see here, um, you know, all of these rivers were leading into the seaway, right? We did have some drainage down here to the south, but everything was draining into the sea. Well, as we leave the Cretaceous and head into the Cenozoic, right, which is the major era we live in today, the seaway uh, moved off of North America as our plates are shifting around. And today we obviously have no, we no longer have a seaway sitting on top of North America. We can have lots of conversations about where we're going in the future, uh, deep time future, but that's a whole nother conversation for another day. And so as that seaway moved off in North America, this is when the Mississippi River really started moving, right? Because now it's got to find a new place to drain and it started eating its way down south. Now, when I say down south, I'm not talking about Louisiana, right? At this point in time, I'm going to draw your attention to this map over here on the left. You can see this white gray line here. This is really kind of where the edge of the continent was, okay? And so um, as the Mississippi River started flowing down, it flowed through and still does today, right? The tip of Illinois at Cairo, Illinois, and this was the original delta. And everything you see, all these colors in here, I want you to notice how they're kind of banded what this really shows us, each color represents a different age, right? Age of formation. And what you're really seeing is over time, sea level dropping and new beaches, right? Slowly progressing forwards as the continent is building. But what you're seeing here in all of this material, this is all the Mississippi River swinging back and forth, depositing sediment. So if you really wanna get a visual of what this looks like, if you've ever been to Mobile Bay, right over here, which looks very tiny on this map, right? You can go to the Battleship Park and look across the bay. And really the Mississippi River embayment is just a gigantic version, right? Of Mobile Bay. And so if you can take that and swell it up 10,000 times, now you've got what the Mississippi River system kind of looks like. So it really shows you how much A, of a land builder, right, this is, it's pretty incredible. Uh, and why we're gonna talk in a little bit why we should be really harnessing that power. But B, just the incredible uh, pathway of time, right, that it's taken to build this section of our continent. And on top of that, um, lot, or the, on top of that salt deposit that we saw, right, form the base of uh, the Gulf of Mexico, we have lots of other rocks that get deposited on. But I do want to highlight just a couple here. Again, I really want to highlight all of them. They're in my heart always. But I want to highlight a few uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, first, to give you an idea of how different Louisiana was uh, in the Jurassic and Cretaceous, after uh, we had that initial salt deposit, this area was under water, not a surprise there, right? But was a coral reef environment. So that goes to show you as the water was coming down here, it wasn't as sediment laden initially as it is today, but that also tells you about our position on the planet, right? That North America was definitely positioned super close to the equator um, because in order to get limestone to get deposited, you have to have a coral reef. And this is what I really love about this rock type, because as I like to tell my students, my superpower is being able to go to a place, see a rock, and know how it got there. 
Limestone is one of those rocks that anytime we see it, we know instantly, right, that there was a coral reef, right, in that environment. And so this whole area you can see here in blue, all across the coast, we have huge limestone development sitting right on top of that salt. And you can see lots of fossils in there. For those of us that love paleontology, it's always great to dig this stuff up. But this is providing a lot of weight sitting on top of that salt. Of course, we're going to get more sediments here we're going to talk about in a minute that are going to sit on top of that salt providing weight, but this is kind of that cap, right, that's sitting on top of the salt pushing down. Now, as we move forward in time, um, really from after that limestone development and kind of the mid Cenozoic all the way through today, that Mississippi River is just marching its way down the embayment. And so I'm going to draw your attention here. So here we are, this, right, Louisiana, you can see Plaquemines Parish right down here. You guys are all over in this little part of the world. And so here, as we move down, I want you to watch this area because we're going to see those sediments just move their way out and deposit all this material and build the coast that we really love today. Not just the end of the river, right, that we love, but the entire coastline, right, as it builds out. And what I really love to draw people's attention to is realizing that the coastline actually used to be way further offshore, right, than what it is today at points in the past as sea level and climate change has fluctuated over time. And now all of this sediment that has come down here is sitting right on top of that limestone, sitting on top of that salt. And that's important to keep in the back of your head for just a couple of slides here. And so this quick 250 million overview brings us to today, right, the modern delta. Um, and so just to kind of review the modern delta, um, so this is generally where everybody's kind of used to coming in on the story, right, the last 10,000 years or so. We know the Mississippi River works just kind of like a loose water hose in your backyard, right? It whips back and forth across the landscape. The Mississippi River today, with all of the locks and dams in place, including the Atchafalaya, brings down 550 million tons of sediment. That's an incredible amount of sediment. And so what happens, right, is the river's moving really quick. It's like it's in a pipeline and it's carrying all that sediment and it hits the Gulf of Mexico that's not moving very quick and all that sediment drops out. And as that pile gets too big and too long, the river moves over and finds a shorter path. And so as we kind of look through this history here pretty quick, you can see some of our older, our oldest deltas right down here on the coastline as they move over, right? And we begin to build the Tesh Delta over here, you see, and this gets very long. You see the river doesn't wanna take this path of long resistance. It wants the path of short resistance. And so as it eventually finds those shorter paths and crevasses and avulsions occur, you get new deltas that form. And then we get the St. Bernard Delta, which is the delta that I, my school is on, right? That I get to teach on. And of course, you can see at the end of the um, St. Bernard Delta, we have the Chandelure Islands over here, kind of marking some of the edges of the hard parts of that old delta that are out there. As it switches, right, these areas start to become sediment starved and degrade. And you can see now this moved over to the Lafouche Delta, which I assume most of you live on, right, that are on this talk today. And then as that delta continued to build, a final shorter path was found, and that's the Plaquemines Delta. But what I really want you to notice about this delta is how meager it is compared to all of the other deltas. And we're gonna talk about why this delta is so small here in a second, but Clearly, I would love to have a nice big fat delta like this to live on, right? So now let's shift into some of the human pieces of this. Let's weave the geology into the human part. Where did we go wrong, right? How did we start tinkering with this system so much that now we have to have, right, a master plan to fix our coastline? Well, I like to trace back, at least on the lower part of the river, because the river is quite a long beast, back to 1831 with Captain Henry Shreve. Um, he was a steamboat captain, which Shreveport is named after him. And, you know, in bringing people down the river, this is, this is a little bit further upstream where the Atchafalaya breaks off the Mississippi River. This is pre-Shreve, right? Pre-Shreve's mess uh, tinkering, we'll say. Shreve would go around, right, this big loop here, this big bend in the river. And if you're on a steamboat, A, you're already going slow. And we already know human nature does not like to go slow, right? And so this big bend in the river annoyed him greatly that it would take hours and hours just to go this little bit. And so what he did is he dug a cutoff, right? He dug a shortcut. 
And in digging that shortcut, he made his life a lot easier. However, he forever changed the shape of the lower part of the river. Because as you can see, the Red River used to flow into the Mississippi and the Atchafalaya would come off. But once you cut this off and cut the sediment and water off from here, you can see it no longer looks the same and it's all degraded where the Red River now flows into the Atchafalaya. Now, the other important component of this story is in this area, there was some very historic log jams. And this is actually an image from the 1830s uh, of these log jams. And these log jams were of major historic importance, especially to Native Americans that lived here. Because these log jams would come from up north, right in the spring, jam up the river, slow the river down, and you would get lots of water overtopping and sediment deposition and big, beautiful swamps, right? That would definitely form as a result. Well, if you're trying to get boats through here, however, you don't like those gigantic log jams, right? And some of these log jams you can see here is 30 miles long, right, was the Red River Raft. So state of Louisiana said, let's get rid of it. Army Corps of Engineers, right? All these guys, let's get rid of this big log jam. And they got rid of the log jam and in doing so and in freeing the river, it created a massive scouring event. And that water just ate down at the bottom now that it could flow freely. And that's what made the Atchafalaya deeper, right? Than the Mississippi River. And because of that, now we have to have a whole series, right, of human engineered projects to make sure water continues to flow down the Mississippi River. Because water likes that path of least resistance, it would much rather flow down to the Gulf through the Atchafalaya, right, because it's only 142 miles to the Gulf than the Mississippi, which is 315 miles to the Gulf. So I like to kind of pinpoint this as our beginning, right? Then, of course, we discover oil and gas. And why do we discover oil and gas? This brings us back to the salt. So all of that weight sitting on top of the salt pushes down on it, all of those sediments. Salt acts like a liquid. When you push down on it, it wants to move upwards. I'm sure most of y'all have heard of salt domes before, right? Especially if you've ever been to Avery Island, right? You've been on a salt dome. So what happens is all that weight causes that salt to move upwards. But as it moves up, as you can see in some of these pictures here, if I've got a layer of sand sitting right here that has lots of petroleum in it, as that salt dome moves up, it tips those layers. Well, once it's tipped, all of that petroleum and oil and gas will come up to this top part around the salt dome, making it much easier for us to extract. I always like to think, man, I can never get sand out of my car. That's always hard. So I can't imagine trying to get petroleum right out of a sand lens. So these salt domes made it incredibly easy, right, to get that, that petroleum out. Now with that, we also developed sulfur extraction, sp specifically where I live in Plaquemines Parish. And we developed some of our first offshore rigs, right, due to, to sulfur extraction. This is what a salt dome really looks like in seismic, just so you guys can see uh, real world science. Seismic is basically like the ultrasound, right, inside the earth and gives us some of those views, right, of what it looks like. So here you can see all these rock layers and how they get tipped upwards, right, right around that salt dome. Of course, now we know today, right, in discovering all this petroleum, we've dug about 10,000 miles of pipeline right through our marsh, which we know allows salt water in and allows the marsh to degrade from the inside out. It's not just the Gulf of Mexico slowly eroding the edge of the Gulf, but allowing these highways of salt water to come in really, really intensifies that degradation. Of course, as I know most of you have all learned, right, in, in previous talks, we've really exploited this place, right, of all these natural resources, right? We've hunted lots of organisms, right, uh, almost into extinction, as Jonathan talked about this morning, right, as we first started, uh, and which is why now we have the nutria here, right, because we wanted to hunt some more things. Um, we brought those guys in, and while they are adorable, right, they eat all of our, <laughs> they eat all of the natural plants that are here, um, those big, beautiful swamps that were allowed to develop because of those log jams and spillovers in the spring, right? We logged the heck out of this region uh, and the scars are still seen on the earth today. I really, I love and hate these images all at the same time because uh, you can see here on Google Earth, all of these radial lines, anytime you see a straight line, it's not natural, right? This is from cutting down those cypress trees and dragging them through, right? And creating these areas for these cypress trees to move through into collection. 
Um, and then of course, right, we have things like the Mr. Go, right? Some shipping canals and I, this picture just always gets me. Look at this big, beautiful swamp back here and these big, beautiful old growth trees just getting blown into oblivion so we can bring ships up the river a lot easier, which of course we know ultimately caused some of the demise of New Orleans and St. Bernard and Plaquemines Parish during Katrina. And then really, you know, again, it, we could go a thousand different directions on why we have some issues here in the coast. But, you know, historically, one thing that really caused some major issues was putting up, of our, putting up our levees. Levees are great and bad all at the same time. And the history of the levees uh, on the lower part of the really, river really comes from the, the great flood of 1927. And this wasn't a hurricane, right? This was a major springtime flood that happened in the Ohio Valley. And you could see this water coming, right? It takes about 90 days for water when it drops in Mississippi or in uh, Minnesota to work its way all the way down the river, right, to the bottom here. So when it rains up there, we can see this water coming and prepare. Well, I'm going to talk here just for a second about this because I really think the human dimension here is really, really important. Um, you know, people that had some local interests in New Orleans and businesses were really worried about this water coming down and busting levees, and they were worried about their big expensive homes on St. Charles and their businesses. And so they petitioned the state to try to blow a levee to relieve the pressure that they thought was going to be coming. Well, the engineers had basically told this business group, no need to worry about it. We know where the river's going to bust, which is over near the Red River, right? The area of historical issues, right? And they said, it's going to bust over there. We don't have anything to worry about. Well, political clout is political clout. That uh, petition got passed and you can see they went ahead and blew a levee here. The levee was blown uh, over where the Carnarvon Diversion is in St. Bernard Parish. And they blew it in a very historically um, underrepresented, uh, poor, depressed region. Um, and, you know, in doing some research before for another project, I read firsthand accounts of, you know, people that were living in St. Bernard, packing their homes, packing their wagons, their mule drawn wagons with everything they owned because they knew they weren't going to come back to it. And in the meantime, you have people that were boating, you know, loading boats, rich people waiting in the river to watch this giant explosion. And if, you know, that's just a huge dichotomy of interest there, right? You have the rich waiting to see the death and destruction while it's all too real for the people on the other side of the levee. Um, but after that flood of 1927, people said, never again, we can't let this happen. And we have now straight jacketed our river, right? From Cairo, Illinois, all the way down. We have levees, right? Going all the way down to Venice, Louisiana. And because of that, we've disconnected our river from its marsh. The river now can't really swing around and build. It's built out as far as it can go. This is the edge of our continental shelf here in this picture. So all, you know, 330 million tons that comes down here, right? goes right off into the Gulf of Mexico. And of course that causes subsidence and land loss in and of itself. We know this one all too well, hurricanes are a major cause, right? Of land loss as well. We lost a lot of marsh, right? In Ida, an incredible amount of marsh that washed around. And I can tell you in Plaquemines Parish, we got some of your marsh over here because uh, we were uh, driving boats, trying to help some people. And we had to drive through some of that flotant that floated all the way over here. Of course, invasive species are, are not great either, even though some of them are adorable or make beautiful flowers, right? They, they also consume the natural resources of the area. So, uh, and, and one last little piece that I always like to plug in is we have to remember that the earth is a dynamic system, right? It's, it's not static. We live in a very short time frame, but the earth lives in a very long time frame. And the Gulf of Mexico, back to one of these original images here, um, if you go back in time, the, the, uh, as the river builds out, you have loose sediment that's getting deposited down here. On the north shore of Louisiana, right up above Lake Pontchartrain, you've got harder sediments. Hard sediments doesn't stick to soft sediments very well. And so we have these big series of faults that are here. Uh, our large system is the Baton Rouge Fault Zone that you can see. Um, and what's happening is something that has historically happened across the entire coastline where this soft sediment is slowly sliding its way off of the hard sediment. And when I say slow, it's slow. It's like half a millimeter a year. So it's nothing to worry about in our time frame. But eventually what will happen is this entire section of Southeast Louisiana will fall off into the ocean. So 
Yay. Um, but I like to bring that up because, again, this is something that's happened before, right? Over here on the coastline of Texas, there was a large mega slide. This is thousands of years ago, the Lobo mega slide, where the entire coast of Texas fell off, which is really incredible when you think about the kind of tsunami that it would have generated, right, going across the Gulf of Mexico. And don't, don't mistake my excitement for actual excitement. It's just geologic excitement. Okay. So, um, and of course, our current situation, we know, right, we have predicted that 18 inches of sea level rise is going to come into our area by 2050. This is currently kind of what we look like. And I want to show this map and not just a regular map because the blue here highlights the water rich sediment. And so, you know, when we look at a regular Louisiana map, we might get a little bit of false insecurity. Um, but, you know, when you look at the water rich and marsh marshes and count that as water, there's really not a whole lot of solid land right down here. And this is why it's really important that we focus on rebuilding our coast. But what does this look like with 18 inches of sea level rise? Well, this is what we're in store for, right? And this is within our lifetimes, okay? So this is tangible things that we really need to prepare for. So all of that light blue is now going to be right? A watery area. It doesn't mean it's going to be open water. That could be all, all hard ground that's converted to marsh, but it's not going to be solid ground. And so where is our hope? And I'm going to, I know I'm going to talk about our hope here in a, in a little bit, my personal hope, but reconnecting the river back to the marshes is so incredibly important. And we know we're working on some human-led efforts on that, but I want to highlight some natural efforts so we can see what this rebuilding looks like. Mardi Gras Pass is a natural um, crevasse and diversion that has occurred. Uh, this is all down in Plaquemines Parish along the river. This is an area you can see here. Um, so just to give you some context, this is Mardi Gras Pass. Here's the Mississippi River. Uh, this is the Gulf of Mexico basically out here. And over time, what happened, there was a large rain event, right? A high water event that kind of started eating away at a road. Um, this was originally a road, which is why it looks straight. And as um, the water overtopped and kept eating away at this system, it eroded out this road and reconnected the river to the marsh in an uncontrolled but natural way. And over time, you can see here, just from 2012 to 2016, you can see how much marsh is rebuilt right out here. And today it's even better. You know, it's there's some spots out in Mardi Gras Pass that you almost need an airboat, right, to get through. Um, and another one I wanna highlight because it's been in the news quite a bit and, um, I really love it because I spent a lot of time out here is Neptune Pass. Uh, Neptune Pass is a little bit further south of Mardi Gras Pass, but it's another large diversion that's opened up naturally. Um, here's, these are some very serious, uh, close series of pictures here. So you can see that it's very new. It really started opening up in 2019. Um, but I'll show you this picture because this is a little darker, so it's easier to see. This is Neptune Pass right over here. And it's delivering lots of sediment um, out. This is a much shorter route to the Missis or to the Gulf of Mexico. Mississippi River doesn't really want to go all this way. Um, today, this is, this is what it looks like. This is a picture from uh, Dr. Kolker at LumCon um, from earlier this month. And so you can see all of these nice uh, mouth bars where it's rebuilding a whole brand new delta over here. And in reality, if we let this river do what it wanted to do, it would reroute and go this way very easily. Um, but this is where we struggle between nature and human control, right? Because we also rely on the river to bring all of our goods and services upwards. Um, so it's a very interesting point of conversation. And then, of course, we also have sediment diversions that we are putting in place as well to really mimic what we see with Mardi Gras Pass and Neptune Pass. But these are going to be more controlled, where, you know, gates are just opened um, during high water events to let that, you know, during the springtime to let sediment and water out. You can see here in mid Barataria and mid Brenton that'll eventually start. The uh, construction's already started for mid Barataria. I drive past it a couple of times a week and they're already getting ready to, to dig ground there. And so this will do the same thing where it'll build a nice little sub delta out here to rebuild that marsh. So there is hope, right? There is hope. And so with that, I hope you enjoyed the whirlwind geologic tour of the last 250 million years and why it's important to you. And I am always happy uh, to take any questions or comments. Thank you so much for that, Jacqueline. And so um, we would like to open up for anyone um, who would like to uh, to ask Jacqueline a question. <clears throat> yes, Jenny. 
Oh, I'm sorry. It's not. Ju- <laughs> I was like Jenny Shack Snyder, but I can't. I. That's Dr. John Ducey. I, I, Dr. Ducey, you, you you were off the screen for a second, so I couldn't see who it was. Oh, but sorry. No, it's okay, Dr. Ducey, please. So, Jacqueline, nice talk. Thank you very much. Um, I was curious to to know how you felt about the recent uh, discovery of the apparent age of the LSU campus Indian mounds. Um, One of the ramifications of that study is is that the Indian mounds were situated in such a way that they were actually looking downstream of that prehistoric bay or lake that you showed in slide number three, which, Mm -hmm. which... it is a phenomenal concept, right? They built these elevated structures to look all the way down the estuary. So I was just curious what you thought about that um, that recent research and the controversy over the true age of those mounds, if you have any opinion about that. Yeah, I um, thank you, Dr. Ducey. I appreciate the, the question. Um, you know, A, I, I really uh, am with you on that excitement um, because, you know, we look at these mounds and, you know, it's very easy to think of this as a nice regular watery landscape without all these levees and how did people live here and handle that, right? And so to really connect the age of those mounds with, right, these older deltas just makes so much sense, right? You could really understand how they were living in this watery changing landscape. Um, I was actually quite excited to hear about the age of these mounds. I actually just recently worked it into one of my lectures. Um, so that might tell you how I feel about the controversy. Um, I, you know, I, I feel I haven't really read too many uh, scientific papers about the, the carbon dating uh, that's occurred on any of those mounds. But um, I, to me, it makes perfect sense. I am, I am fully in support of uh, these mounds being that correct age to sit in that delta. It's just, it's a beautiful thing to connect together. Thank you. Dr. LaFleur. Thanks for the uh, talk, Jacqueline. That was very cool. And um, I teach and you teach. And sometimes one of the things that I'm I'm most interested in is showing students, sort of showing them the lesson with their eyes. And um, I was wondering if you had your favorite place to bring students where you can sort of see geology. Oh, man. That's a, that is a great question. That's a great, that's a question that relies on funding, um, but <laughs> it's a great question. You know, in general, I just like bringing students out into the marsh and any place in the marsh, because um, as we all know, it's hard to bring whole classes of students out, but bringing students out into the marsh, even in St. Bernard, you know, you can see, you know, we go out to the Great Wall of St. Bernard, you know, and you can really see the impacts of Katrina. We look at old maps and, and, and then go out there and realize, right, where we are currently taking some salinity samples used to be land. And that really kind of drives home a lot of those points. Um, but I would love to say my new favorite place to bring people, which I haven't really brought too many students out, out there, but I do uh, teacher professional development to bring them out into the wetlands, is out in Quarantine Bay where Neptune Pass is, is running is running wild, right, depositing sediment. Because if you're out there during periods of low tide, you can walk on this brand new land that's out there. And if, you know, and it's hard to talk about climate change, it's hard to talk about sea level rise. These are really kind of depressing topics when you live down here. But to bring people out where there is new land emerging and vegetation is getting set up and you can see that subaquatic vegetation, it's just, it's incredible uh, to, to know that there are places that are building and it, it gives you a little bit different perspective, right? On, on how things could go, right? In the future. So Quarantine Bay is by far my, my favorite place to play. Yeah, I like it. You know, I've been just a little south of there um, by that Fort, Fort St. Philip uh, crevasse. And I was surprised at sort of what you're saying when you stand on the land, I thought it was gonna be muddy and mushy. And it was like hard sand land. Yeah, it's incredible. These new these new islands that are showing up in Quarantine Bay, they're hard packed. Like you could probably drive a dump truck on them. It's legit amazing, right? Liquefaction is not necessarily happening there. It's really incredible. Um, but I know over where, where you kind of go, you know, there's that big terrace field, BS11, right? That's over that way. And it used to be this open water open water area after the flood of 73. And now you almost legit need an airboat to go through there. It's so successful. So those are just inspiring places to go. Thanks. 
thank you for that. Anybody else have any questions um, or comments for Jacqueline? I, while other folks are thinking, I'll, I'll present this to you. When you had uh, shown the slide about um, the old river control structure, one of the things that I've heard often is that that is a place of, um, uh, what's the word I'm like, it's, it's risky. It seems like when the waters are coming down, the old river control structure is put under a lot of stress. And sometimes people worry that if it's gonna hold or not, and if it doesn't, what's gonna happen? Do you have any um, comment or thought about the old river control structure and its ability to, to do the work that it was designed to do? Yeah, that's a really great and almost loaded question. <laughs> I really like it. Um, you know, it almost failed in 1973. You know, it scoured out underneath and, you know, there was water flowing underneath the structure, right, in 1973. So, and then, of course, it came back and was retrofitted and fixed. But, you know, we have to remember that we are humans, right? Our engineering is never, ever, never, ever going to beat Mother Nature's engineering. There's no way. We might be able to hold back things temporarily for a little bit, think we have control, but we don't, right? Mother Nature is the best engineer around, right? She uses no opinions and just straight physics, right? So, you know, in, in my opinion, and this is, we, we get into this in my classes a lot, when we look at the answer geologically of, of the old river control structure or how to save our coastline, it's very obvious, right? The river probably should be flowing that direction. Now, of course, that was a man-made issue, but you know, in reality, if humans weren't here, the Mississippi River would have eventually switched over to the Atchafalaya, right? And if you take one day in the Atchafalaya, you know what a healthy system looks like. It's beautiful. And that's what the Mississippi River should look like, right? Um, but when you add the humans in, that's where things get complicated because we don't like to change. We like things to stay the status quo. So I really wish that we could figure out a way to live in harmony with the changes of nature to allow the river to swing around and rebuild all those big, big, beautiful deltas, right? And that we can all have land to live on. And maybe that means that maybe we just have summer camps down here and we have permanent residences up further north, right? You know, just like Native Americans did, right? Where they moved in and out of the system seasonally. Um, but you know, the old river control structure is only gonna only gonna hold for so long, you know, just like any human engineering feat. Thank you very much for that. I really appreciate the that that insight. Um all right. If no one has anything further uh for Jacqueline, um, we would all like to know what is your hope for the coast? What gives you hope in, in all of these challenges that we face? And that's a, to you, a question to you, Jacqueline, I'm sorry. And you're on mute. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> thank you. I'm sorry. No, you're good. Um, you know, my hope for the coast is, as I showed you in those last few slides, those diversions, you know? Um, I know there's a lot of, there's a lot of controversy around them, you know, salinity levels change, the fisheries change, oystering changes. Um, but in reality, we are facing a massive slow moving catastrophe, right? With sea level rise and climate change. And my hope for the coast is uh, starting to allow nature to do what nature needs to do and learning how to work with that. There's so many amazing opportunities where we can have fishermen or shrimpers instead of maybe shrimping nine months out of the year, maybe they're shrimping six months out of the year, but maybe three of those months they're out there planting willow switches or our oystermen who are experts beyond any of us at building oyster reefs are out there biz building living shorelines. Yeah. So my hope is that through understanding these natural systems and hopefully breaking down academic and fishery uh, barriers, that we can really work together and use our all of our experience to make this a much better place. Thank you for that. And I, and I, I think everyone would agree with me. Um, with your presentation as well, your love for the coast and enthusiasm for all of this is infectious. And it's so nice. I don't know how you do it, but you do it really well about, it, it's like the spoonful of sugar that helps the medicine go down. You're the spoonful of sugar and thank you for being that because I, I tend to talk about this and it's always very, 
Debbie Downer, like, wah, wah, wah. and you, you talk about this and you still present that information, um, but you do it in such a way that is hopeful. And we need to, we need to multiply you and we need to clone you and, and have that around us all the time. Thank you so much for, for presenting today and, um, and helping us to, to, to really see that hope. I appreciate that. Anytime. Thank you, Jonathan. And thank you all for having me today. It's always such a treat to, to meet new people and talk about the things that I clearly love. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. All right. Um, I'm not sure if uh, Simone is with us. Simone, I don't know if you would, uh, if you're here, if you'd like to talk to me about the position statement and where we stand with folks uh, signing on. Yeah, so thank you so much to everyone that has signed on. We, the BCC, a diverse group of folks, iteratively developed a position statement that states our values and principles as we think about how to integrate people and culture into environmental planning. So you can visit the Louisiana Folklore website to read the position statement. And if you agree on, with it, please sign on. You can sign on for yourself, or if you're authorized to do so, you can sign on as a representative of your organization. We have the QR, QR codes right there that you can also scan. And I believe, yep, uh, Maida put my email in the chat. So if you have any issues signing on, please feel free to shoot me an email. Thank you so much for that. Um, next, here's some information about our working groups and when they meet. Uh, the French Language Immersion and Preservation Working Group will meet on Tuesday the 25th at 2 o'clock via Zoom. Um, we had a really wonderful uh, in-person, well, hybrid meeting. I don't know if, um, David, if you are with us today, I can't see everybody who's here. Um, is Mr. Shermie with us? Maybe not. Okay. Um, well, or Robin, if, if you'd like to, you were anyone in that working group would like to talk about um, that work would be great if you're available, Robin. Maybe not. I saw that you just came off a of mute, but I can't hear you. And I can't. There I am. Oh, there um, you are. I was uh, sorry, I couldn't unclick my. Oh, it's okay. Um, so yeah, we had a really great meeting this week. Uh, somehow we managed to do five hours on Zoom hybrid. <laughs> we uh, nailed down what the main issues around French are that we want to work on. And in the last few days, we also have a date for what we're calling the French Language Summit. And so that will be on October 7th at the West Baton Rouge Museum. And the four issues that we want to work on will um, all break out at that summit into separate groups. And the four issues, I might not be able to do this off the top of my head, are um, creating a census to get a grasp of how many French speakers, French and Creole speakers are in Louisiana, working on um, immersion, getting an immersion school, um, working on the idea of creating a PAC, a political action committee for French, and I can't remember the fourth one. But It was uh, the one uh, based around community and sort of the website that would sort of be a clearinghouse. And clearinghouse, then the French yeah. website, yep. So, and, um, and all okay. going into that uh, economic empowerment side of things, I guess. Yes, well, yes. <laughs> we'll right. discuss that we'll economic empowerment. For this right, right. <laughs> So, um, yeah, it will keep everybody um, abreast of that summit. It was really a wonderful meeting, um, very well organized. Miss Ivy, who is also, I think Miss Ivy is on this call, uh, did a wonderful job facilitating uh, that group. Amy uh, did a, I mean, it's, it's, I, I in, after after the meeting, I called Maida and I was, and shared with her how impressed I was that from these meetings that we're having, there are these working groups who are really doing meaningful work um, that will move the needle forward on these issues. So it, I was um, so very impressed with all of that. And thank you, Robin. Thank you, Ms. Ivy, for all the work that y'all are doing, um, as well as the other team members. Um, so then we have the culture and coast planning. Um, 
let's see if anybody is within that group feel free to to raise your hand if you have any updates um or if you're with the preparing receiving communities um it, or if you'd like to join them i'm not sure when the next meeting on that's going to be but if you can email uh haley or tracy about that you can find that information and artists and tradition bearers will uh, be meeting the third Tuesday at six o'clock. Next meeting is Tuesday, July 18th. Um, you can get in touch with Lauren if uh, you would like to join that working group. Um, with that said, here are the um, email addresses if you would like to um, contact these folks to be a part of that group, if that is what, uh, if that is where your passion lies. Um, and uh, here is the, um, we hope that you will join us for our next Bayou Culture Gathering. Um, Ms. Liz Russell will be our presenter. Um, she's with the Louisiana Environmental Defense Fund, Environmental Defense Action Fund, um, who will be talking to us about environmental impacts in the human dimension. And that will be uh, Friday, July 21st at 12 noon. So please mark your calendars for that. We're excited to have Liz with us. Um, and if you all have any announcements that you would like to share, any information with the group, um, we would love to hear from you. Any announcements? Or maybe everybody's excited about getting into the conversation when we turn off the recorder. <laughs> um, all right, here's some ways that you can connect with us. Um, and some of uh, you know, the work that we've done. Uh, you can watch some of the gathering highlights, which are on YouTube, as well as Zero Skidmore's poem, The Flow of Culture, which was inspired from our first year of work. Um, we thank all of you for being here with us today. Again, Jacqueline, thank you so much for being inspiring and um, yeah, and all of your work that, that you do.